So it sounds a little bit pedantic, but it's really not. I'm, I'm coming back to the question, which I think is a really important question, about who was organising the exhibitions that were going to Europe and why. And um, in fact, uh, you, were, you were saying, uh, Jason, about the... Uh, you thought that the first shows, there was just not enough money being invested. But in fact, the, the history of those shows, the first ones, are extremely interesting and has to do with the politics in China that um, probably many people in this room know better than I do. But the first thing that my Chinese scholars and friends always remind me is that in 1924, modern China was exactly, 50, well, not, not even 15 years old, what, 13 years old. And there was enormous instability in the, in the government and in the people who were being appointed immediate, in, in that immediate period. So Lu Xin went there and then he was kicked out and then he had to leave, uh, leave Beijing. And then there was Lin Feng Mian, who I mentioned, he was appointed, then he had to leave and they would go south. And there started to be a big separation between uh, Beijing and Shanghai. And the further away you got from Beijing, the more autonomy that you had in terms of experimentation and what it was you were doing. And my great hero, who I don't actually mention, I had to take his name out because I had to cut back on my length, but my great hero is a man called Tsai Yuanpei. And Tsai Yuanpei was a scholar uh, who had studied in Germany and uh, just an extraordinary man who was appointed the first minister of education of the Republic of China. And if you track all the shows that, that happened, many of them, if not most of them, were at his, at his in initiation. And this very first one, two things happened um, uh, which were very important. The first was in France, there was a creation of a China Institute in uh, Lyon, I think it was, and another China Institute in Frankfurt. And at that point, there started, through those organizations, there started to be an assembly of great scholars and one of them was a man called William Cohen. And uh, for those of you who know the British system, William Cohen, who was key to all of these exhibitions taking place in China later, later uh, in uh, Europe later, was uh, driven out of Germany. Most Sinologists, uh, at, at, it, all these shows are going on like 19, up to 1937, but by 1936 and 1937, William Cohen had a Arbeitsverbot. He was forbidden to work, forbidden to teach, and had to flee Germany and ended up in Oxford where he founded the, uh, uh, the school there and a lot of the collection that is actually in, um, at the Ashmolean came from him. So what you had in 1924 with the very first exhibition, Tsai Yuanpei himself had been thrown out and he went to Europe briefly, and he gathered together all of the artists who had been working in Europe, brought them together to show their works. But nobody in Europe was ready for a modern China. They weren't conceptually ready. And the other thing that was going on with all these exhibitions is that there was personal envy, personal jealousy, personal ambition. And the two great figures who were competing with one another were Liu Haisu and Xu Bai Hong. And the Xu Bai Hong show that went to Paris, he'd send back notices and say, this is the first exhibition ever. And Liu Haisu would write back to China and say, mine was the first exhibition ever. And they tried to uh, demolish one another with their own special projects until finally Tsai Yuanpei said, in 1934 and 35, enough's enough. Our country needs us to join forces. And he managed to get Xu Bai Hong, Liu Haisu, and the various schools to come together 
to create this one exhibition, which is why the 1934-35 was so important. And it was the first one to get the national support from the other governments. So in other words, it's you have all these forces coming together at one time, personal, political. Yeah, do you want to add? No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. This is my friend. Actually, um, no, but I, I just I want to make one other point about these uh, Chinese, um, these exhibitions sent overseas to represent China. I just want to make the point that the whole idea of having an exhibition of art is as a new thing in the Chinese context. A traditional uh, paradigm is more about private transfer of, of you know, so... Um, whether it's exhibitions for overseas or whether it's exhibitions at home for an, a national audience developing a sense of a public for art and making people through art feel that they are uh, one people or something like that it's all it's all the whole that whole culture is really so new so it's it's unsurprising if there there are some steps to be made to work out how to do it to represent yourself to others let alone to represent yourself to yourself to get yourself to feel you are yourself or whatever, you know, so. <laughs> um, I wanted to um, step back. I think this is also a mic. Is this, is this talking? Yeah. Um, I wanted to step back and um, kind of look at a, a, a broader issue that is what kind of brought us together. And that is, actually it started with a conversation with Natsu, who should be up here, by the way, because you're definitely a presenter and part of all this. Don't we have another chair? I could find a chair. Um, so early on, you know, Nats and I were having this exchange about um, what, uh, you know, how a symposium could relate to GPIC and, and Isamu Noguchi and 1930 and all of that. And, um, and I sent a message, I, I hope Natsu forgives me, but I said, I would strongly like to see the rubric <laughs> East and West removed from the title. <laughs> and um, and Natsu so kindly indulged this uh, um, rather selfish request. Um, and so the the term encounter, you know, it came up as an alternative mechanism for dealing with some of the issues that have often been uh, addressed under the East-West uh, kind of rubric. And um, so I think it's, uh, you know, a really good opportunity to take stock and see, like, how that worked out with the various papers and, and especially, um, you know, we had great uh, respondents today and, and um, the, this issue and, and dissatisfaction with this East-West uh, kind of rubric came up several times. And, and so I'm thinking about, okay, so how does encounter, how does it function? And, and like our collective works, I think, um, start to uh, map out a, a framework for thinking about, about uh, what encounters are and what, you know, what, what the dangers are and you know, how, they, how they play out. And I think Natsu's exhibition is like one extraordinary statement. A apart from what happened between Isamu Noguchi and Jipaishi in 1930, what happens upstairs because of your installation is this extraordinary intershuffling of works that kind of provide like these endless uh, opportunities for comparison and for contrasting and for you know thinking about these terms and falling back on like an east-west binary just <coughs> won't do it. it. It's much more uh, subtle and much more localized than that. And then I'm thinking of Yasko's paper where um, you know you have um, Koyama who, what is he? He's an engineer of encounters between lineages. He's like taking, you know, taking Picasso's ceramics and saying, that's not part of the lineage of Japanese ceramics. And then he's generating this new lineage in Japan, in Japanese ceramics, that's called international ceramics. And it's quite extraordinary. And, and then David is, um, you know, he's like recommending to us that we need this um, multifaceted, situated way of looking at world art history. And it's going to look at, it's going to look different depending on where you stand. And that's, I think, a really fruitful 
recommendation for us to try. Yeah, I mean, one example I think of is uh, David Summers' Real Spaces, which to me is trying to kind of map everything into one story. And I feel it's a little bit too soon to do that. So um, if you have like these encounters that are now narrations on the part of art historians that are situated variously, then, you know, you come up with things like, I mean, in a way, your paper is a very sort of... Um, discouraging sense of what an encounter is because it kills the artist, right? They end up dying in the end. It's kind of very tragic. Well, I just don't want a happy story that all encounter is a good thing because we have to take account of, um, you know, imperialism, or which uh, colonialism, which is still a reality in the world up to today uh, in new forms, you know, constantly being reinvented, inequalities of power. So we need to be aware of that background, uh, not in some rigid way that we, but, uh, to, 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 to look at things, but just aware that uh, all... I want to see dialogue, but I'm aware that dialogue is often from uneven positions of power. So it's easier for some people to have encounters than others, and. Well, you, you'll, get, you'll be encountered with whether you want to or not, as it were, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that in, in Joanne's paper, the, uh, the, you know, this, uh, from Lu Xun, this, this active uh, positivist, you know, we are going to go out and aggressively search for encounters. We're going to get them, and that's a good thing. There's nothing to be ashamed about. Um, but then there's another moment in your paper where there's this term broken tradition, mm -hmm. and, and I wondered what, what if that insinuates a need to repair it or to like fix it or to you know that its unbroken condition is is something to to go back to, and if the encounter is responsible in part for for breaking it. Boy, that's a question. <laughs> um, my mind is leaping from one place to the other. Uh, two stories, one from 1929, which is the first national art exhibition in China. And uh, they brought in work from Europe, uh, uh, French work, German work, and a large contingency from Japan. And it launched a huge debate, a very, very public debate between Xu Baihong and, what is his name? The, the, sorry? Yes. And the big debate, it was called I Am Confused. And basically what, <laughs> what, what Xu Bai Hong said was that he thought that the French artists were superficial, that it was a market, you know, that uh, or, or cubism was just a market development and that the real tradition that should be looked at were, you know, the great painters, many of whom were, were, were German in his eyes. And the big public debate was about um, whether or not Xu Bai Hong was just, a, you know, a boring um, young man who, who didn't know how to accept modernism. And I tell that story to come back to the point that you made earlier about having to this you know, global idea of what the West and the East, there is, there is no single East, but there is no single West. And that these encounters that were going on, uh, on one, uh, depending on where the studies were or the emotions were or the skills were or the passions were of the, those who were encountering it and being encountered, uh, the, the results were completely different. So in terms of the German traditions, the irony out of all of this was that the artists that Xu Bai Hong was praising had already long been thrown out by the, by the European modern as being irrelevant. And they wanted to break with that tradition as well. So you've got this, 
this sort of uh, real, real mixture going on, going on there. Now, to come back to the question of whether or not that was something in the past, there's, uh, there are some very interesting scholars right now in China who are trying to come back to the traditional aesthetics, model of aesthetics. And one of them is the theory of Yi. And this was a, a, an aesthetic theory that was developed back in, uh, I think, 1000 or something, and AD. And now there are Chinese scholars and theoreticians and very famous curators, including the curator of the great 1989 show that led to what some people call the beginning of modernism. They are now trying to assess contemporary work in the light of Chinese aesthetics. They are trying to recuperate a tradition because it was broken. So if you look at those two narratives, the stories are of trying to bridge traditions that can no longer be recuperated, but trying to find a new place for them within discussion on contemporary practice. Maybe that also relates to uh, Christina's um, approach of, toward the, this, this problem of like saying, hey, it's not East and West or Japan and, and the US. There's like a third term. And you know, maybe that's where it happens. I think you use an interesting term, the generative uh, context of this contact zone and you know how Aborigines are actually maybe the fulcrum of a relationship there. Does that um, sound like a, a, a like a, another kind of encounter? It sounds like it's a fruitful approach for your work. No, um, absolutely. I first came in contact with the word contact zone um, by reading the work of Mary Louise Pratt, and she works on travel writing. And I was interested in a lot of these early travelers and kind of their initial encounters and contacts with native peoples, and, um, and she uses it. And, and the reason I liked it is maybe the same reason that I like the way Celeste de, uh, defined encounter earlier in the sense that on the one hand, it's this grappling, it's, um, it can be seen in a positive light, you, you know, you're struggling in, in a generative way, you know, in a creative way. On the other hand, there might be some problematic aspects of it um, and an encounter or a context zone. There are, are necessarily um, issues of domination and subordination in unequal power structures. And, um, and this is something that I think um, David tries to get beyond in his talk, absolutely. So um, in a sense, I, I like the idea that um, you have these zones of interaction. And I guess for me, um, the idea of an encounter not being necessarily between one person and one person, the fact that it's defined by multiple, act multiple actors, and not only encounters with people, in my case, also an encounter with a dead person, um, in the case of Matsuda, um, but also the encounter of with objects um, and the encounter with cultures and these kinds of things. So it's a really uneven, but it's an interesting landscape. Um, Jason, in, in, in your um, work, it's, it struck me, this incredible exhibition, international Chinese exhibition in 1935 and and you you suggest that there's a kind of nationalist competition involved if i read you correctly between the various nations submitting chinese works to that exhibition you have a list of 13 nations that includes turkey and india and sweden and i mean i can understand japanese competition there i can understand korean and you know chinese and but um, what, how does that uh, kind of friction, uh, what is the nationalistic uh, advantage for a country like uh, Sweden or India, or wh how does that work? I think I started working at, on that 35 show while I was at the Nelson Atkins. Mm -hmm. And in 35, the Nelson was only a couple years old. Sickman made it a point to give the best pieces off display and get them there, no matter what. And that, set a stage that he competed against Boston, which is 20-something, I mean, famous for his collection 20, 30 years 
already by the time it gets to this Nelson being formed. So I always saw it as a competition, or at least then uh, someone to ignite you to show your collections and share the collections. Uh, but it's also definitely has imperial roots because, of course, Sweden wants to show off that they did find the Peking man bones. They do have a great collection. They did document. France and uh, Britain were fighting for cave findings of paintings and sculptures. And that's why they're in national collections. And so I think there is a competition. First of all, it was to get there, find it first, and mapping, and then control, like uh, define where the, the zones are, and then take natural resources, and then commercial interests. I think there's always these, uh, not evolutionary, but steps that happen naturally. And it's competitive in nature. It's interesting. It's kind of a post-colonial studies approach, which says that just like the imperial powers are carving up Africa and other parts of the world, so these um, uh, you know, uh, art historians and anthropologists are carving up the archaeological. Or even the market. I have to compete to get yeah. a piece. And so there's always, I think there is a competition. Maybe it's not the right word. Encounters. <laughs> Encountering challenges. But I think there is this jostling for position. Um, in relation to that, I have a question about the various kinds of um, competitive encounters. Um, how about like different fields or, you know, since I addressed uh, um, um, this problem of ceramic, which has been considered sort of inferior or unimportant in comparison to paintings, sculpture, even perhaps prints. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, you. So, so many of your talks um, dealt with uh, this very interesting early earlier exhibitions um, in 1920s, 30s. How were um, Chinese ceramic works represented? Were they considered um, important enough to represent the nation in comparison to sort of paintings, either old or new? In the first exhibition, the one that Sai Yuanpei put together, uh, they brought the modern painting, uh, but they had quite a large, uh, uh, quite a large section. Very large section was historical material, but it were including ceramics, including embroidery. In fact, that was one of the things with the 1929 national exhibition. It included a huge section on on embroidery as well. So the notion of culture was very diversified, but the ones in the 24 exhibition did not come from China. They uh, gathered together all the collectors, the Chinese collectors who were living in Europe. And that's where the objects came from. That was just the first one. And, and that's a different show. The one uh, that Jason's talking about is, is of course, um, a, a major, uh, major object, major and very important historical objects. But this was from private sources. I think there's something about the, at least in the Chinese context, the special cultural value of the the brush tradition. You know that. Um, so I've maybe it's, that's something to do with Noguchi engaging with the brush as, a, even though he's primarily a sculptor, because that's where there's a sense of the three dimensionality of tradition is to be found. That it has a cultural status that. Um, three-dimensional objects maybe don't have in quite quite the same way. I, I'm struck, for example, in modern Hong Kong sculptors who want to emphasize their Chineseness, like there's one called Van Lau, and he will make sculptures of bamboo, you know, because bamboo is a kind of valorized subject for Chinese painting. You know, he can't really find a root in Chinese sculpture that he can connect to his Chineseness through in the same way. One of the things he, he did uh, set out to do in, in China and, and then even in Japan is to um, find, I think the term is, a uh, Tang figurine faker. Somebody who was like making these tomb figurines as fakes and presumably he wanted to like absorb some of that skill and formal quality and produce modern sculpture. But, um, but another question um, for Natsu I, is, you've, you've done all this great work, and now you have the luxury to see these, these works hanging side by side. 
And does it change your sense of the encounter that, you know, is the topic of the, of the exhibition? Um, well, um, just listening to what, you know, others were talking about, the encounter and the sort of a uh, problem, problematic side of it, this particular encounter and what was if there are any injuries, you know, how, you know, Noguchi interpreted Chibashi's, you know, works, but in his very sort of a coming from the West, very in, in maybe a little bit arrogant way. I wonder if there's any, and I, I guess I've been thinking about that. I haven't really um, come to, you know, find some answers, but if you, it, it become my question to you, is if you see maybe Bert, maybe, can say something about that. I'm going to um, slip away from that because I saw <laughs> that Alex had something he wanted to say. So this is just a very brief question to follow on what you were talking about earlier. Um, it seems to me that um, the, the views we saw of the 34-35 exhibition actually were installed in a very interesting way that you have the paintings and there were a lot of objects. And I'm just wondering, I mean, there's obviously, there's the Chinese view of what is significant, which would have put the brush painting very high up. Uh, these exhibitions seem to be presenting a rather different picture. The international exhibitions seem to be emphasizing a, uh, you know, it, well, I could put it one way. If, let's say, France was going to be represented in China, it would probably be an exhibition of French painting. The Chinese, the Western constitution of what a Chinese exhibition should be is this thing which looks, I mean, it almost looks decorative, you know, you've got a few paintings, you've got, you know, some ceramics, and you've got, and interesting that it's embroidery as well, I mean, you just would not include that in a, in a Western show of Western art going to East. So I wonder if you've got any comments on the sort of disparity between um, a Chinese self-representation and then the representation of China through these international exhibitions. Um, one of the, I think we need to make distinctions between the shows because the, the, the one that I keep coming back to as the model is the, 30, the 1934 that traveled to 30, through to 35 that started in Berlin, where William Cohen was involved, where, um, uh, all, where Tsai Yuan Pei was involved and all of the leading modernists. And that exhibition did not have um, anything, any embroidery. Those uh, those paintings, those modern, what they call modern ink paintings, were hung uh, in a row as if it was, you know, the standard uh, Western presentation or even in, in China the, of, of the individual objects next to one another in a very clearly defined exhibition format and, was, and they were not hung high and they were not intended to be presented as... Um, in a salon hang. I don't know if you want the, to add to that. I think there's just the, the works themselves, scrolls are only meant to be out for a little bit, then they roll back up. So already we're, the exhibition uh, changes the appreciation. But then um, there were arguments in the, in the Burlington Magazine about critiques about how the, the show was hung because so many of the paintings were so high and you couldn't read the inscription. So there, there were critiques already at, in, in the, the London show, and I think it just um, is trying to make public something that was never meant to be a public. It was supposed to be with a group of us just look at it and shut it, because we're privileged already because we can, we can understand it and appreciate. So that privilege to make public is very difficult, and it was a hard time for getting people to appreciate it by inter introducing them, but it's a, it's a pri privileged state that's even f now trying very difficult for us to put it on display and get people to uh, engage it in a, a meaningful way. There's maybe an interesting um, comparison of Japanese exhibitions that were very deliberate self-representations overseas. And um, one dramatic moment in that evolution was when um, the first post-war uh, Japanese exhibition comes to the US and um, uh, there's an attempt to um, alter the uh, image of Japanese art history um, and take it away from small objects and 
focus instead on monumental big objects. So instead of little netsuke and tsuba sword guards and things that, you know, allow Americans to say Japanese people are little too. You know, there's suddenly these large Buddhist uh, uh, sculptures that have a monumental quality to them, and that was very effective in, in um, elevating the, the sort of a, the image of, of Japanese art from, from craft, little dainty, you know, crafty, uh, well intricate kinds of things to uh, something substantial. Celeste. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up on that and make another little comment about encounter because I think one of the things we want to do is maybe take encounter and uh, break it down into different kinds of encounters um, wherein I was struck, because we often say exchange and encounter interchangeably, but in fact exchanges are a very particular form of encounter, and I think there one of the issues is the representation of a culture through metonymically through some kind of an exhibition of stuff, right? And I'm thinking about it, of course, you know, the Rijksmuseum's been closed for 10 years and now it's reopened, and guess how everything is presented? They have integrated what used to be, you know, the uh, deck arts with all of the paintings. And in a sense, its mission now is to present the culture in a in a very different way, even though um, you know, so it, so it will no longer be that Dutch painting is the thing that represents Dutch culture. It's going to be this other array of stuff. And so what's consciously chosen by the promoter of whatever the exchange is, is really going to reflect some notion of how can you encapsulate the culture in a bunch of objects. And that ne doesn't necessarily then reflect the kind of, um, I mean it might, but it needn't reflect the hierarchies, uh, the aesthetic hierarchies or you know, the conditions of making out of which all these things came. And that's a kind of complicated business once you start to, you know, uh, unravel it a little bit. But it seems to me that those, I, I saw those two um, vectors kind of intersecting in, in your um, various presentations and certainly um, um, uh, Yasko's, uh, I think, also uh, brought this in with ceramics, which I have to say, I'm sorry, I think the best ceramics I've ever seen in my life are, are Japanese. They're just really fabulous, and they continue to be. I mean, I'm never bored at, a, at a, you know, an exhibition of Japanese ceramics, sorry. Um, in relation to both uh, Professor Winsor Tamaki and the, um, um, thank you very much for your comment too. Um, um, yes, I, I think the, the way uh, the ceramic exhibition in 1951 was arranged uh, was very much like the exhibition that Professor Tamaki talked about. Um, it's very much um, sort of engineered or, you know, by at least two parties, um, the U.S., uh, in this case, France and, and, and Japan. And in that case, it's, it's American um, government and the uh, Japanese government. And uh, the importance of Koyama's situation is he was very much sort of, um, I don't know, part of a government. He, he represents the, um, the, the Japanese, particularly uh, cultural um, um, preservation bureau, that, that kind of interest. Um, later he seems to sort of shift away from that. But the way, um, I think particularly the, uh, the American uh, exhibition that uh, Professor um, Winsor Tamaki was talking about, it was very much done by GHQ uh, <laughs> and also Rockefeller heavily involved. And uh, you know, also interesting, the emphasis on art to be the item to be presented to the United States from Japan um, has so much to do with sort of um, give Japanese people a chance to feel better. That's what they thought. I mean, it's, it's a kind of an awful thing to say, but 
And ceramic was also very strange. Uh, the, the, one of the reasons why I was interested in ceramics was, I mean, ceramics not necessarily purely art all the time. It could be um, very strong export items, and it was part of a sort of a economic promotions to show how Japanese uh, ceramic object can be good to be sold abroad. So there's a lot of political and economic um, in interactions and interests from several different parts, and it was all done by the name of a diplomacy. Are there questions from other folks, uh, uh, comments? Then? I have a question for Natsu, but I'd like to make a comment about this discussion of exhibitions coming to the United States. I've done a, a couple articles on the Chinese Art Treasure Show in 61, 62, which was a very painting-centered um, object focused uh, exhibition, almost some ceramics, but mostly paintings. And there are several reasons why that happened. Actually, the converse of many people on both sides, the Chinese and American side, wanted to bring bronzes and sculptures, but it was determined that those were too hard to transport, uh, even though the US Navy was bringing them across. And also, for a very important reason, different than Japanese exhibition, because the Chinese exhibition was arranged by the National Palace Museum as it was reconstituted, not yet with a building, in Taiwan, and so it didn't involve Buddhist temples like the exhibition from Japan where temples and private collectors were involved in giving the objects um, to come over. So there's a lot of really fundamental differences in what ends up there, even though the Japanese exhibition is first. I mean, most of us in this room know there's tons of amazing uh, Chinese Buddhist art, and much of it is in Japan. Um, so <laughs> that's probably another reason why the religious aspect of the um, Chinese art treasure show is different. Um, my question for Natsu, and this is a really basic question, but um, in looking at the Noguchi drawings upstairs, um, I was really, I'm inter interested in the process because as I looked at them before I looked at the catalog, I had a sense of the sort of gestural ink wash coming first and then the, the drawings of the figures coming second because especially with that boy in the string, you see the flying white and it's hard to imagine the gestural things coming after. And yet, if I'm not mistaken, um, I think uh, Long Xiaojun's um, essay suggests the opposite and makes a very um, strong statement that this, this abstraction destroys the figure. And I wonder, you said you talked to conservators. Could you figure out which way it goes? <laughs> or is it a mixture? Oh, you, you asking my own opinion? Well, um, I, I trust uh, my, my um, well, our uh, East Asian uh, conservator, and uh, so what he she said was that um, if he did uh, the ink wash uh, later, uh, you don't really see these um, you know gestural I uh, mean the fine lines, uh, those are uh, with the uh, more thicker ink, um, you don't see them so clearly. It will be breathing, so. Um, and that really, um, she, she commented that maybe two or three weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, until that time, I was just thinking like uh, um, uh, you or, you know, um, Professor um, Lao Xiangjun, um, and that, that, yeah, it was opposite. And that really, if you think about, you know, uh, the process of you know, abstraction, that comes more natural. But this, and looking at these works to, um, in a you know in an exhibition, um, and I came. I, I tried to still sort of make that you know process possible. I mean that in, in my head. So um, and that's really uh, you know something that I, I think I I want everyone to sort of think about this. Um, I'd like to go back to Celeste's um, distinction between encounter and exchange, and. Um, ask you if, if y you, you feel that the difference is one of uh, one, uh, something that's planned and engineered and designed and controlled versus something that's accidental. And if, if that's the case, are the accidental types of, uh, of encounter, are they, are they th there, isn't there some sort of intention there that's like even maybe directing the outcome of what might be accidental, or just how you see that relationship? You know, 
It's really nothing big and theoretical. It's just something that I observed in, you know, thinking about the issues today and then listening, you know, to your papers. It struck me that there, um, that w one of the things that we were talking about this morning was the extent to which coincidental events, you know, produce things that are worth thinking about when we're considering, you know, art in whatever context. So these, the, the encounter, just as a term, encompasses this notion of chance and things that happen by accident unexpectedly. But obviously exchanges um, are planned and so they have a different shape, a different structure, and you would ask different questions. I think what I'm interested in is what kind of questions do we ask under what circumstances? Because it's obviously not going to be a one-size-fits-all. And for me, the important things that have come out of the conversation today in a, in a very general way um, are the, you know, um, the importance, the fundamental importance of situation and situation being very much grounded in particular historical circumstances. So we're not going to find theoretical models for how to deal with encounter in, you know, a generic way. But I think that when you go to the specifics, then, you know, the challenge is, okay, well, what am I going to ask of this situation? And what are the most important things? And I think with an exchange, a cultural exchange, it's pretty obvious you've got institutions involved and you've got very clear interests. But then when an artist happens to do something and that encounter with another artist, another culture, um, uh, a political configuration of events, you know, that can, anything can happen there, and you're trying to look at the anything can happenness of it um, without a kind of, you know, overdetermined sense of east, west, color, line, you know, whatever. And, and so I think one of the things that I feel compelled to do after listening today is, is uncoupling things that get mapped onto one another sort of a priori, like linearity and the East and form and volume in the West. Well, that's silly because we know that within those um, figural operations, these are, uh, these are complementary options and they're options open to anybody, but they get coded in these very interesting ways once we situate them in um, a, you know, a cultural interpretation of, of somebody's work. So, um, so I think, for me, it's about not taking much for granted, which, you know, is scary, but it's fun. Can um, I, Alex, you? I mean, just to follow on from that, I think there's a kind of, well, not quite ghost in the cupboard when one's talking about the 19th and 20th centuries, but it's the modern and the non-modern. And I think that there is a kind of way that so many studies are based on the birth of the modern, the advent of the modern, the confrontation of the modern. And then, then it's sort of broken down. Different places have different modernities. I think maybe we should sometimes, I think it's not a term we should banish, but I think a lot of times we don't need it. I think people are kind of hiding a lot of things under that. And it puts a value system on it. It creates this modern versus traditional, which may not be the dichotomy that's really at work. And uh, I think modernism in particular is a term that we can kind of bracket out in a lot of discussions of Mark. But I think that's sort of one of the hidden dichotomies into which East and West and, you know, uh, Sorry? Oh, okay. um, one of the hidden dichotomies is, and I've been contributing to it today, is that the so-called competition between Japan and China, which is maintained in all of our research and exhibitions to the present day, was at the turn of the last century not the case. And in fact, one of the least studied areas uh, or, the, or the areas that have been studied, but it's the least discussed, is the relationship between China and Japan and the fact that 
because of coincidences, for example, Leo Haisu had live models, naked models, he had to flee, went to Japan and spent time there. Many artists spoke Japanese fluently, were exhibiting regularly in the uh, Japanese exhibitions. And uh, Lushin, for example, as I mentioned, was his venue was the Uchiyama uh, bookstore in Shanghai, where there was a, a constant exchange between the two countries. <coughs> and in fact, some uh, scholars have called Japan the substitute West for China. So if we hadn't complicated it enough, I think that's, that's the big missing area for neutral, for neutral research in this area because uh, on both sides, on the Chinese side, uh, there's a, there's, uh, uh, it's politically loaded and on the Japanese side as well. And, uh, but that's the only way we will be able to move really forward is, is when we take into account that there were both intentional exchanges, joint exhibitions, Sino-Japanese exhibitions, and there were unintentional encounters that had a huge impact on the development of artistic practice on both sides. I think that's especially relevant to Isamu Noguchi's move into, into China because it was an unintentional encounter that took him to China, partly as a Japanese American. So I think that's you know a good example of that. Yeah. Christina, you were gonna say? Oh, I, was just, oh. I just wanted to respond to your really insightful comment about maybe the issue of this term modern um, in, in the case of many of our talks. And just thinking about my own work, um, so often this question of what is modern uh, played out in those anthropologist letters to the Japanese government. And in many, many ways, it, what it was, it was, you know, become modern like the U.S., you know, but it was always a discussion between Japan and the United States. The indigenous people were totally absent from that conversation. And yet, you know, if we think about modern in just the sense that, you know, they're, they have advanced, you know, they had advanced, you know, and, and yet they were completely left out. Um, so in a sense, um, your comment really, uh, you know, highlights that issue for me, and it's, maybe this term in and of itself is very loaded and uh, has other problems. So, yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? No? Any other comments from our presenters? Jason. One more complication. I, I had it in my talk, but I, again, cut it. Um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about, and we have the, Japan and India and China with the West, um, Japan with India, but having Korea connected as an intermediary always gets overlooked. We're very much a, a Sino-centric, Japan-centric, and but of course the show has those factors upstairs, but how does, how do we look at the 1922 exhibit of, hosted by the Japanese Imperial Government within Seoul where rather than modern and contemporary, it's, uh, the, the, it's Western. The, where the, the West is the anomaly. It's, everything else is just, it's just art for them and, and, and it's categorization. Everything else would be Western, it would be a frame piece and oil. So and that might be a good foil for us to expand a little farther because these books, these catalogs are very, um, uh, robust. It was hundreds, 150, I guess, um, participants. 60 maybe were Western. The rest were traditional. And Koreans um, did win some of the awards, in addition to the Japanese, when they were held at the uh, on imp former imperial grounds of Korea. So that's a complication I think we can throw in the mix, hopefully at a later date. Well, before we add more complications, I think <laughs> we've come to the end of our time. I want to say thank you one more time to Natsu Oyobe for making all this possible, and also to David Taverka for organizing all of this, and thank to you. all the presenters. Thank you very much.
Thanks for coming, everyone.